So folks, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, there's a lot going on and we appreciate you making time to listen and participate in the subject matters that we feel are important. Um, there's not a week that goes by, at least it seems that way, in which we don't have some situation where a client calls to alert us to the fact that they've been hacked or that they've had some cyber risk uh, where we're calling investment custodians and bank accounts to reclaim lost assets or to change passwords or to install double authentication to deal with this threat. Um, cybersecurity seems to be um, one of the most important household protection subjects uh, that anyone could be dealing with right now. And um, we also, we being Riverside Financial Group, um, have been called on by our compliance firm and the industry in general to heighten our own cybersecurity protection on your behalf to make sure that your critical information is safe. And so in order to do that, we um, brought on or hired a wonderful IT security company out of Stanford named CMIT and Linda Cuppersmith. Am I pronouncing that right? Or do you like the, ooh, the Coopersmith, the more German? It's the, yeah, it's the Coopersmith. Although when, right. whenever I have to have somebody spell it, I'm like, I say Coopersmith. So okay. it's, the next generation is going to change it. So Linda <laughs> is one of the principals of CMIT, and she has helped our team upgrade our cybersecurity. And in having those conversations and learning about the different things that we have to install to have more viable cyber protection, we've learned and been um, immersed in all the different sneaky ways that bad people can attack you uh, virtually or through a cyber um, approach. And it got to the point where we felt this is information that everybody should know. It's relevant to everybody. It's relevant to our children who perhaps think a little bit less of, of these kinds of issues. So we felt for our inaugural knowledge series for the 20. 22 to 2023 season, we'd start by bringing Linda on as an expert to teach us about how to set up better cyber defense. And I would imagine that, um, you know, we could use her as a resource if anybody had any follow-up issues. But um, I, I think that's all you need to know. The need for cybersecurity is ubiquitous. So you probably don't need me to tell you anything about it. So I'll hand the baton over to Linda and let her walk us through this. And then after we're done, as is our custom, we'll have time for question and answers. Absolutely. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, I, I love the opportunity to be able to address people because the thing that we hate is getting the phone call that somebody's had some kind of a cyber incident. And so much of this can be um, protected against and avoided if you, if everybody would just practice, you know, a few simple things. Um, you're getting me at a really great time because I just came off uh, four days of being in Washington, DC with uh, 2,800 of my uh, favorite colleagues um, within the IT and the cyber uh, security world. And we had the uh, real honor of being able to spend 90 minutes with the head of the cyber crime division at the FBI. And so that was just, that was wonderful to be able to get another point of view in terms of where are really the areas that you know we have to be able to watch for. Um, as I've said to many people, my view when it comes to cybersecurity is a pragmatic view. Um, where is the low-hanging fruit that we can protect ourselves about? Where are the absolute must-haves and best practices? 
So to be able to give you some context, um, the latest estimates are that there is $4 trillion on a global basis being lost to cyber crimes. Right wow. now, cyber crimes are a hotter and larger overall than any of the drug cartels. That is how much money is being made. And money is the motivation here. Don't think about it at anything. The cyber crime techniques have evolved from being a hooded hacker, working inside of some basement, being able to try to poke something and make something, you know, be able to prove that they're doing it. This is big business right now. And big business means that um, there are kits. So you can put yourself into the hacker um, business for a couple hundred dollars. You don't even have to know anything about technology. And you can pick up some YouTube videos. And then you can sign yourself on with a cyber crime affiliate so that you don't even have to know what to do. And you can sign on and work on the coffee shop so that you're being very anonymous. And all you have to be able to do is generate leads because it's a sales type of a situation. So you're just going to generate leads. And then when you, you, you know, and I call it poking. So somebody's kind of poking here, trying this, trying that, trying that. And as soon as they're able to get through, they don't have to know what to do with it. They just hand it off to the next, the next you know, person in the line. And they now get a split of whatever is going on there. So as I said, extremely sophisticated and we call it ransomware as a service now. And so that is the, the level of sophistication that is really going on here. So what we're going to cover tonight are, are, are three areas. Um, what are the three most frequent ways that cyber criminals and cyber um, software gets in and be able to start being able to do that damage. Then we're going to talk about what are the kind of things that you yourself, and I call it do-it-yourself cyber, um, can do in order to be able to better protect yourself. We're then going to talk about what to do when it happens, because unfortunately, it's no longer a matter of if it's going to happen, but when it happens and what you need to do when that event happens. And then, um, of course, um, we can send out the deck because I've got a whole wonderful set of uh, resources that you can also use to be able to better educate yourself. And, and really, that's my mission. Um, you know, I say to people, it's a, I, we need to be able to save the world one click at a time. <laughs> because right. it is, yes, because that, that's, it, it really, it, it's about, the last line of defense is the person that's between the keyboard and the chair. We can build all the kinds of sophisticated ways of being able to do it, but the person is the one that is operating that computer and giving it commands and allowing it to do things. And so the education part of this is very important. So cyber is not just an IT problem anymore. Um, cyber is something that you need to become educated at. I think another one of my analogies is, um, you know, you were, we all learned how to be able to drive a car, right? Did you just get into a car and, 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 and drive it? No, you had to have somebody teach you how to be able to do it. You had to learn the rules of the road, learn what are the right etiquettes as well as the right safety things. Operating a computer on the internet is the same type of thing somebody no longer, it's not safe for somebody just to be able to take a computer, hook it up to the Wi-Fi, and then just go wherever, wherever you want. It's not. So we need to all spend time and educate ourselves and become better and better <coughs> you know, computer professionals and be able to use the technology <coughs> so much incredible power um, and be able to, to use it in a, in a wise and responsible manner. So three, the three ways that hackers get in. Does anybody know? What's, what's one, one of the three ways? What do you think? Hmm. I'm going to guess phishing. Yeah. Phishing, absolutely. So that's the number <clears throat> one way right now that, e that somebody is able to gain entry into your computer. Because at the point that you click on one of those links in the email, 
you are now, a, you're saying to the computer, oh yeah, that I'm allowed to go on that link. And that link oftentimes can look absolutely legitimate. Um, it may say, oh, you know, we need you to be able to sign in with your um, Adobe credentials because you need to be able to re-sign this contract or this document. And the scary thing is, is that there is so much information out there in the dark web, they're able to <coughs> know that you're closing on a house. And this was a recent scary story that we, we heard from, from one of our clients. Um, and sure enough, it was that the seller um, had just at the point of the closing gotten an email that says, oh, last minute change. You need to be able to wire the money to here. And he shows up at the closing and he's like, did you get, did you get my wire? And the, and the attorney's like, what are you talking about? He's like, oh my God. And so yes, $25,000 wire, he had gone out to be able to take care of that last item. All because somebody was able to actually watch his email, watch what was going on from the social media standpoint and targeted him in a way with an email. And he just kind of went in and fell, and fell for it. Um, think before you click, watch those attachments and they're getting clever and more and more clever. So if it doesn't make sense, if you, if you say to yourself, why am I getting, you know, an email from Amazon about my password? Well, even if you think it might be, well, pick up your phone and log on to your account. Or if you get an email from your bank being able to say, you need to be able to log on, don't use the link that's in that email. Go to the web browser and be able to, to add that in. All right, so that's one of the big, big ways. And the only way to really be able to get around that is to educate yourself, you know, by waving your mouse over that link to be able to see whether the link sends you to someplace that's kind of unusual. If you're getting a link, if you're getting a message from Amazon and you wave your mouse over that link, it should have some kind of an amazon.com link that's associated with it not someplace that's, you know, completely unrealistic. Um, so the most prevalent way, um, it, it, I'm gonna start with that. The number one technique is passwords, lack of password hygiene. The estimates right now are that 86% of cyber breaches are caused by a lack of password hygiene. The reason this is, is because unfortunately we do have breach after breach. And every time there's a breach, that data is being sucked into the dark web, which literally, right, I've seen the dark web, it's dark, right? You go in there black, you have to know where to be able to go, but they've got incredible databases. So every scrap of information is correlated inside of databases. So they know the three different personal accounts that you use. They know your driver's license because that was part of a breach. They know your social security number because they know that kind of a breach. They know your shopping habits because Google, of course, doesn't protect any of that information when you're surfing um, and on and on and on. And so as soon as there's a breach in one place of a password, they say, oh, let me try this password on all of the email and all of the accounts that I know belong to you. So the first thing is that people just end up reusing passwords. And so that is the most you know, frequent way. And we're gonna talk a lot more about passwords. So the number one way is, is, is passwords, something having to do with a password. Number two is phishing. And number three, coming at a close you know, um, you know, lineup on this is people working with outdated computers that are not patched and don't have security updates. That are not, so, what, what was the word? They're not patched, they're not up to date. So it's the, it's the Windows updates. It's when Chrome, if you look sometimes on Google Chrome in that top right-hand corner, it sometimes will have a little dot and a, a little amber dot. And that means that Chrome has some updates that have been pushed onto your browser that are really important, but you need to close and reopen the browser in order for that installation to be able to complete. So, you know, when the computer says, hey, would you like to be able to update, you know, the recent, the recent you know, Apple updates? Right now there's, um, there's a, a Apple actually um, issued, so there was 12.1, we went to 12.5, now they're up to 
And these are all security updates that have come out within the last two weeks. Um, and so we do have a, uh, an update that is um, being actively exploited. So, but Apple has done its job and be able to say, okay, here's a way to be able to close that. But if people don't update their computers, and so one of the things that I see people so often do, especially with a Mac device, is at the end of the day, they just close the cover. And then they open it back up again. Yes, you have to be able to take the time once a week to be able to restart your computer. You know, power it all the way down, power it up, be able to do those restarts because that's the way we let those updates be able to up and go. Okay, so now we're gonna move into what are the kinds of cyber protection that you can do? So the first one is password hygiene. Um, and we're gonna, come, we're gonna come back to that because I have a whole separate slide on that. We've now talked about the operating system updates. So when Adobe asks you to be able to update, so you need to be able to, to make sure that you're running those updates and rebooting your machine. The next one, number three, is your internet provider's router, right? Router. Right, that router. So it's a little box. So you sign up for your new Optimum or uh, Frontier or Comcast version. They, and they give you a great deal. They give you a free, you know, they're going to come in, they're going to do the installation, they're going to give you a free Wi-Fi device. And what you now have is you've got the internet connection, which I consider the world wild west and the plague. And, and if we, we have dark clouds and white clouds, but those dark clouds are right there on the other side of that internet connection. And your internet provider, it doesn't care whether you're safe or not. They just want you to be able to have a great browsing experience and never call them from a technical support basis. So they're not gonna do a whole lot to be able to protect you. So you need to be able to add a device in between there um, to, and, and get a, you know, a router that's going that you have the ID and password to or to very, very minimum, periodically call up your internet provider and say, hey, could you check and make sure that my modem and my router have all the latest updates? That is a very, very, you know, kind of an important and, and an important thing that you can do. The next thing is being able to run some kind of security software. You know, we used to call it antivirus software, Norton or McAfee. Those are actually dinosaurs now in today's world. Um, in order to be able to intelligently keep your machine safe, you need to be able to use something that's now called next generation antivirus software. And next generation means that it's using artificial intelligence and some behavior recognition in order to be able to do that. Um, at a business level, we absolutely believe in a product called Sentinel One and it's wonderful. But unfortunately, it's not available unless you want to buy 250 seats of it. So for the home users, we would recommend a product called Sophos Home. It runs about $45 on a yearly basis, and it's been performing very, very well on both your Windows machines and your Mac machines, because those Mac devices also need to be running with some kind of armor around them right now to make sure that they... Um, are, are able to combat things. Would you repeat the name of that product? Called Sophos Home. So Sophos is spelled S-O-P-H-O-S. And there will be a link on the resource slide that we'll be sending out. Next, equipment updates. Equipment is not just your laptop, but it is your Wi-Fi. It is, believe it or not, your television. Have you ever gone to be able to like do something with your television and all of a sudden you can't do it? Well, the televisions even need to be updated. And some of those updates are security equipments. So if it's a device that connects to the internet, there's some way of being able to update it. And those updates are important because they're closing new bugs and new security updates that be able to happen. So your Wi-Fi device, um, and all of those, you need to be running and, and educate yourself to be able to get those updates done. Next item, public Wi-Fi is not secure. 
Um, you know, it used to be, um, right, we went into a hotel and at least we had to type in a passcode. I don't know about you, but increasingly, I'm going to places where the, you just connect even without a password. That means everybody and their mother can get in onto that Wi-Fi. And that also means that you're sharing a network space with other machines that may be, may be a hacker in disguise. It may have some malicious code because somebody isn't running some good antivirus on it. And so if you do connect to public Wi-Fi, you wanna be able to, to do it, maybe use your mobile plan instead of being able to use that public Wi-Fi. And if you, if you do do it on your phone, not the computer, certainly that you use for work purposes um, or even that you use for banking purposes. And you wanna be able to say the same kind of things if you're in a hotel or an Airbnb, those networks also are not secure. If you do have to use them, hop on, hop off. Don't leave your computer connected to the Wi-Fi when you go out to dinner. Um, it needs to be off because that connection is, is not secure. Next item is separated. The, um, may I ask the, the SOFO, if that, was in, if that were installed, but does that have any protection while you're using public networks? It does. It, every piece of security gives you some protection. It is about layers of defense. So to be able to um, you know, use kind of some of our COVID things, right? So all of the different techniques that we learned during the pandemic add to our safety, right? Keeping six feet away, washing our hands, wearing at least some kind of a mask, wearing an N95 mask. If you have to be able to go into the hospital, you're gonna be in, inside a full PPE guard. Each one of those things reduces the chances. The same thing goes on for computers. Each additional thing that you do is going to be able to help. It's not gonna be 100%, but it's absolutely better than running naked in the internet. All right. Separate work from personal. Have a work computer and a personal computer. If you absolutely have to be able to use one device for both purposes, create two different accounts on it. I'm operating right now from a MacBook that I also use for personal purposes because it's, it, it, it's, it's handy, it's convenient, but I do have two different logons. There's Linda Work and Linda Personal. So the personal side is where I do my surfing, my shopping, um, but the work side, that's a different profile on the computer. So that's just another, another type of uh, technique because you wanna be able to keep that sensitive information in a much stronger kind of an environment. Next, um, everybody that's here or watches this recording is doing some level of security awareness training, security awareness education. Um, there are some great also um, articles and resources that I'll send out that are out there so that you can test your cyber awareness and quizzes, um, but being able to read and, and continue to educate yourself is very important. Second to last is data backups. Um, we have to be able to back up our data. As I said before, it's not a matter of if, but when something happens. And so when something happens, you need to know that those precious photos, those precious videos, and certainly your financial documents and downloaded statements from your banks and your trust, those documents need to be in a backed up location. Um, it can be another cloud location. It can be a service. Um, it, it can be you know, a separate you know, USB drive, but there needs to be another copy of that information. And which of those choices do you think is the best combination of security and ease of use? There are a lot of products out there. Um, if you go with any of the good cloud backup providers, that's really the best way. So the cloud backup, and it's not just like syncing it, like doing a Google Drive or your OneDrive. It's about having it a copied into another location. And so um, there are some resources there in the um, resource slide to be able to help people with that as well. Can you name one example of a cloud backup provider? Um, Carbonite has been out there for a while. 
Um, Dolly Drive is another one that we really like very much. It works very well on Mac devices. There you go. The last one um, are what we call vishing campaigns. This is where there's actually a live person trying to convince you to log on to something and be able to withdraw money out of an account or be able to send you something. They sometimes call up, I'm Microsoft and we need to be able to log on to your computer. And now all of a sudden you're saying, okay, and it says, okay, go to this URL, they do this, they do this. We have unfortunately had a number of situations where it is the people that are more naive. Oftentimes our seniors and people that are just may have grown up in an environment and a culture that are very trusting. They never think that something's going to happen. But the, the, they are out there. Um, the one scary incident we had was somebody had just come back from a bank in Old Greenwich. And as soon as they walked in the door, somebody called and said, oh, I'm so-and-so from the, bra the branch office. Um, I need you to be able to, we, 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 there's something happened with your account. I need you to be able to log on. They logged them, got them to log on to their account. They said, okay, do this, do that. They were just, you know, concentrating and doing this. And they ended up scamming her out of $8,000. And she didn't figure it out for four weeks until she got her bank statement. And we traced it back. That was one that we actually ended up then filing to the FBI because that's a criminal offense for sure. All right. So those are the great things we can do from a cyber protection standpoint and gives everybody a good way of being able to, um, to do that. So um, password hygiene, I'm just gonna run through these really, really quick because everybody, you can, we'll send out the deck to everybody, but you want your passwords to be long and strong. Think in terms of a phrase, put together three words with a symbol in between and a number in the back of it. That's also a technique for one of those ones that you do have to remember that you may not be able to put inside of a password vault, but long and strong and think in terms of phrases and then just mix it up a little bit. Don't reuse your passwords from one place to another. And because we can't reuse them, you're not gonna be able to remember them. So invest in something called a password manager. LastPass has for $4 a month, a family plan that you can have seven people in your family all saving their passwords into a really wonderful password manager that's on your phone, it's on your browser, wonderfully secure. And it even alerts you and tells you if there's been a breach that you from some company and you have an entry in there that you should go in and change your password. Other ones are Dashlane, One Dash, a couple, couple of them out there, but we really, really think LastPass does a great job and it's great value. The other safe place for passwords is actually the Apple Keychain, specifically Keychain. Not Apple the Keychain. But Keychain. So when you're working on your MacBook, it says, would you like to be able to save this password to your Keychain? It's okay to say yes to that one. Every other place that says you can, you can save it, don't save it. It's not Chrome. It's not Edge. It's not Safari. None of those browsers are safe. My guys in five minutes can, you know, log on to your computer and show you all your passwords that you've saved into, into a browser. It's not a Word document or an Excel sheet, even if it has a password. It is simply not safe. And malicious code is looking for that and can pull it right off of your hard drive and it shoots it out. And, and then that's how people get into your accounts. Um, Make sure that you have wherever there is sensitive information, make sure that it's not just your username and your password, but you now enable that extra level of protection, often called MFA, which stands for multi-factor authentication, or 2FA, second factor authentication. It's um, a, an app that you load, you, you read off the code, some of them are really nice and all you have to do is touch your phone with your biometric, your finger, your face. And all of a sudden that's giving that second verification so that even if somebody has gotten your password, they need another thing that you have with you um, in order to be able to gain entry into that account. And then there's a great site called howsecureismypassword.net, 
You can go there and it will tell you how long it would take somebody to bust through that password. And when you get one that is going to take you 4 trillion years for somebody to be able to get through, that's the kind of password you want. You don't want one that somebody can go in there. Every now and then I'll put in the, a, a kind of a phrase and I'm surprised when I throw it in there that somebody's like, well, yeah, that actually is only good for about two months. I'm like, oh, I got to be able to do it. So great site to be able to just test a password, especially your banking ones, um, logging on to financial accounts, any place where that's really that, that real sensitive information and your email account because email is the way that we communicate and so financial um, accounts and email are the ones that you really, really need to be able to worry about. Okay. So as I said, unfortunately, it's not a matter of if, but when something happens. All of a sudden you go up to your computer and you see uh, the mouse moving around and it doing something and you don't know who's controlling it. Yes, that has happened to us. Um, somebody all of a sudden is remote controlling your machine. Um, you come up to your machine and it's got this horrible skull and crossbones and it says, you have now been hit by ransomware. We need 10,000 Bitcoin and to be able to give you the unencryption key and you've got a countdown clock of you know 48 hours in order to be able to do this. Or you click on an email, you enter your username and password and all of a sudden you say, oh my goodness, that's not... I shouldn't have done that. I clicked when I shouldn't have. Um, an account that all, always asks you for a password and that second authorization code stops asking you for that authentication code. That's another sign that something has gone wrong. So when those things happen, one of the first things to be able to do is a, remove the stop the machine from communicating to the internet. Um, if it's hardwired, pull out the Ethernet cable. If it's Wi Fi enabled, just shut down the Wi Fi because you don't want it to continue being able to communicate with that malicious actor that's out there. You also, if you are backing up to an external drive, you want to disconnect that drive because there's lots of ransomware and all it will do is actually encrypt that backup drive because it's connected to the computer. Um, if something has happened in your email, look for different Outlook rules. If you're using Outlook, a lot of times there's different um, malicious code that comes in and it's now sending um, email out of your contact book, but it's very cleverly removing it from sent items and deleting it so that you don't even know that it's it's happening. Look for extra accounts um, and have somebody to be able to call. Um, you know, just like you say, okay, you know, something happens from a medical standpoint, this is the person that I would call to be able to help me out. Same thing when you have a computer, have somebody to be able to call. And of course, you know, an IT pro, um, but a lot of times it, it, it is just somebody that you know is just smarter about all this IT stuff that you can do. But as I said, if, you, if you're concerned that something has happened, remove it from the internet. And if you do have an external drive that you've got backups, disconnect that so that you can at least reduce the amount of harm that's going on. Um, there, as I said, there are cases where we certainly have been called into different incidences both for individual people as well as um, you know, uh, businesses and individual people. And we have gone so far as to be able to work with the FBI in terms of being able to gather that evidence so that they can um, go after and be able to try to capture these people. So um, I think out of the three in the last two years, um, I actually know that one of them, they actually caught the person absolutely and, you know, were able to stop them. So that was a real, um, a, a real victory for all of us to be able to see that happen. So I'm going to hold here and um, I've got a resource page, as I said, that's, um, that was the last slide in the deck. Uh, but I'd love to be able to hear what are the kind of questions that people have, because there's another probably three hours of information about all of this. So tell me what you're thinking. Well, I'll start, but I, I, 
you said that 87% of the hacking access was password um, prevention or health, or what was the word? Hygiene. 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 Password hygiene. So probably hardware is less important, but can I turn in my generic Wi-Fi router that came from Comcast Affinity and, and ask them to give me something that's super duper protected, even if it costs a little bit more? How do I know that my modem has the necessary physical protection in it? Right. So they, your, your internet provider is not going to be the source for that. This is a case where you do need to be able to engage with somebody that knows computer networking. Um, a lot of times the folks at Best Buy, the Geek Squad, um, Staples, um, we, you know, we, you can have a really great experience with them and be able to buy a router. And of course, you can connect and call up. Um, you know, an IT company to be able to help you out with selecting that piece of equipment and then being able to set it up. So it's a device that you said was in between the internet service provider router and your computer? Another Correct. router? Correct. And so let's, I, um, it, it's helpful when we talk about the internet um, to think about it like electricity. So you have electricity coming into your home and you've got a um, it, you've got live electricity being able to come in and it's coming in and there's a big switch that goes into the top of your circuit breaker box. But and that's and that, you know, that is owned by the electric company, along with, of course, the uh, meter that's out there telling you how much you use. But mm -hmm. you're responsible for the panel that's in your house. Mm -hmm. And so you're not just going to take that live electricity you're going to invest now into a panel that is going to distribute that, that electricity and also keep it safe. So the same concept goes with the internet. The internet provider is going to provide you with cable coming in from the street. They're going to hook it into what they often refer to as their modem. And then from there, they may give you a router. You have the option of providing your own router and the big advantage of that is now your internet provider doesn't have the password and um, and username to that piece of equipment. And that's the kind of additional protection that you want. So, so, so uh, we have Xfinity and we've got this white box that is the router. That, so, I, oh, and then that's what the Wi what creates the Wi-Fi signal, right? Correct. So, so oftentimes it is there, there may actually be two different boxes there, um, but we are seeing um, some cases where they're just bringing in one single device that, right. you know, the Xfinity cable is going into and it's right. one device. Um, and so then you do need to ask them to be able to say, I would like a modem because I'd like to provide my own router. Oh, so you turn in that, you get a modem, and you buy your own router. Correct. Correct. So I recently, in our area, we, uh, Frontier Fiber became available, and I'm and my home is only has cable vision, which I can't stand. And <laughs> so Front, Frontier came in, and oh, we'll give you a free Eros router. And so they came in, they put the little optical box that you know in 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 where it needs to be, and they're like, well, we want you to be able to have this Eros thing. I'm like, no. Um, and so I, I, I now only connect it when they say they have to have it there for troubleshooting purposes, but otherwise I keep it disconnected and it goes into a piece of equipment that is part of um, our home network. So Linda, what router would you recommend we use as the intercept between um, there, there are a number of, of good ones out there. Um, Netgear um, and um, is you know a very common one that you see out there. We recently did a workup on TP-Link um, and really were excited about what we saw them coming in with and uh, the simplicity, the support. So TP-Link is probably my, my is the choice that we're seeing most of our, our folks go for. And then the, the routers are rated by how strong of a signal they put off too on top of that, right? So 
Correct. Like a circuit breaker box, it's whether it's you're coming in with 110 or 220. And so it has to be rated to be able to make sure that it can uh, be fast enough to be able to match the internet speed that you've got coming in. So you want the, the faster, the better, I guess? Correct. What, Linda, what is, I can't think of the term, but I hear them advertised all the time on the radio and sometimes on TV. It's something that they tout as making your internet secure. Do you know, you know what I'm referring to? Um, yeah. Um, I, I can't think of the term. Yes. And I have heard those advertisements. We've talked about them. And in our opinion, it, it provides you with only the smallest amount of protection. It's not something that we would recommend um, relying on. Okay. You know, the, the big things are being able to make sure that your machine is up to date and that you're running some next generation antivirus. That's like putting armor around your machine. Um, the, you know, the next thing is, you know, absolutely get a hold of those passwords. Um, and yes, be very thoughtful, especially when you're out on the public internet. Um, airports um, and hotels are notorious places where literally you will find people there trying to be able to get you on their device and not the, um, the hotel Wi-Fi. Is there anything so, to uh, is there anything to virtual provider networks VPNs that should be thinking yeah. about? Uh, yes, yeah. so there's there is a great um, service out there called Winscribe. Um, Winscribe is actually does have a free and it does allow you then to create a secure connection between your machine and their server. So if you do need to operate from a hotel, from an Airbnb, from an unsecure kind of a place you can spin up that secure tunnel so that nobody next to you is able to read the traffic that you're sending through the internet. And it's called Winscribe, W-I-N-D-S-C-R-I-B-E. Right. But that's only if you're off out of your home and you're logging onto a public network. Correct. Okay. But I like the reminder that, hey, you know, you're in the I-95 rest stop Dunkin' Donuts, then you could be on either McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts. That's a <laughs> conundrum. Um, that, you know, if it's something, you know, if you want to look up the weather, maybe it's okay. But if you want to check your bank balance, you do that on your phone or right. you use your phone's data plan as your hotspot or as your Wi-Fi access. Exactly. Exactly. It's so worth, even if you don't have an unlimited data plan, it is worth the small amount that you're going to be using there to, to, to do it in a secure manner. So using data is more secure then. I yes. And so, so I'm probably like mo many people, maybe I'm not, I use virtually the same password for everything just because it's impossible to remember everything. I mean, you got hundreds and hundreds of passwords for all kinds of things. So what you're suggesting is, suggesting is we go and change every one of those passwords to a phrase with symbols and whatnot. And the only way to manage that, I guess, is through one of those password manager. That's right. Products, right? Is that, is that right? I mean, exactly. I hate to admit it, but I've got a Word document on my computer with all my passwords on it. I guess I need to, I need to kill that right away. Correct. Correct. That, um, that, that is exactly it. And that's where the password managers, you know, think about it. If you, right now, you may have that document. You're in there, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. The, at a very minimum, your password manager allows you to log into it and you can copy, paste. It then, what we love about LastPass is that it actually has an add-in to all of the browsers. And when you go to that website, it says, oh, you're at this website. Oh, I see that you've got a username and password and it fills it in for you. 
Oh. So you don't even have to do copy paste. And then I can bring it up on my phone and it's the same username and password. And it works like that on my phone too. So you have to be able to get the settings, but then it'll prompt you and say, would you like me to fill in your username and password? And so honestly, when I first started using LastPass, beyond the fact that it was a much better way to store my passwords, I swore that it, I gained it at least a year of my life, not having to deal with password resets and the copy paste and all of the, you know, trouble that that goes, goes along with it. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Mm. Scary. <laughs> but you, but you also have it all in one place because LastPass allows you to put your bank accounts in there, your social security number. I've got my passport number. So everything, you know, you think about the, um, the, the old um, box in the bank, um, right? The, what, what do you call that? <laughs> Safety box. Box. Yeah, yeah. So like, you know, that's where everybody kept their important papers, but now we don't have important papers. We have important electronic documents and electronic information. And so a password vault is like that, that security box that you can then, if you have one password and you know that everything that you put in there is secure. How can you, tr how can you trust that last pass won't get broken into somehow by some hacker and then all your stuff is exposed. Well, um, as I said, it's a matter of, of, of if, but when. So last pass did have a breach um, three years ago, but all they got was encrypted information. And so if they didn't, um, as long as everybody that had their vaults had a long and strong master password, they weren't able to get into it because uh, the information is encrypted on LastPass's servers, all based on your key. Uh, I see. So I want to go back and I apologize if I'm stepping in front of anybody else's question, but I want to go back to this notion that you want to have a separate work and personal laptop, tablet, whatever, but in lieu of that, at least have different accounts right. on that same computer. And I'm just trying to work through that conceptually because that applies to me. So you're saying that if I access the things that I need to do for these different venues, work and personal, that I would have a different login credential for whatever Internet Explorer I use. Is that what you're saying or y yes so you so first of all so when you boot up your machine it's asking you for a username and a password and mm -hmm. whether it's windows or a mac machine that's called an account and you can have more than one account oh. on the machine okay right away that first gatekeeper yep Got exactly it. exactly and so and were you suggesting that you put your highly sensitive information on one password and your run of the mill, not so sensitive information on another, forgetting work and, and not work for those of us who aren't working. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, when, it, when, it comes, when it comes to passwords, they all need to be unique, both work and personal, because right. what happens a lot of times is that we end up using a personal password as the um, password to use if you ever have to recover it. So you may log on to your um, Microsoft account, but if you have to be able to do a forgot password, and you can't get into your email, your forgot password is then going to a secondary account, which is oftentimes somebody's personal account. And so there automatically becomes the cross between work and personal. So it's just again and again and again, each password needs to be unique. And once right. you once okay. you're in the password manager, it's very easy to be able to deal with. Yeah, no, I was thinking more the the Charlie's comment about the login, the different login, and and should you should you put all your highly sensitive stuff on one login and all your not so sensitive stuff on another login? Yes, yes. So if you, 
again, it's work versus personal. You want to keep all that separate. But right. I think what you're saying is even on a personal standpoint, do I want to have two personal accounts? One that right. I use for fun and entertainment and streaming right. video and another one that I use for my household finances? And the right. answer would be yes. Okay. So I think we've seen a lot of people have um, oftentimes two personal emails, one for junk mail when you sign up for something, and then another one that you, you know, you don't want anybody sending any kinds of spam or junk. You want to clean because that's where I'm getting my bills these days. Right, right. And Lou, you should have no problem because there are more than a hundred famous artists that you can use for fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good idea. You know, an art theme to it. <laughs> I like it. Other well, questions for Linda. Linda, can we have your phone number so when I'm I'm awake at three o'clock in the morning thinking about this, I'll call you. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you, can, you can always send us an email. I do. I do have. No, some. I'm just kidding. Our guys will wake up at six o'clock in the morning. It's <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, Nick, I, I, I very often I get greeted in the morning with the latest information on cyber breaches from from Nick um, as he is actually former Navy intelligence. And so <laughs> you just um, have to keep up on it. <laughs> so the, you know, we, we met CMIT because our home office in Riverside, Connecticut is inside of the building that's owned by Carlson and Carlson Insurance. And they introduced us to CMIT, but we actually, they, they have cyber insurance, cybersecurity insurance too. I, I think yeah. that's just, I, could be wrong, but I think that only applies to corporate situations. It, but... it, it doesn't. Actually, uh, Pure Insurance now also um, offers uh, some cyber protection on a personal basis as a part of their policies as well. I mean, and I don't know if Trip is still with us, you mean that it's a component of their homeowners or? Yeah. What's it called again? Well, she's saying so, that the carrier, sure. The pure. 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 Pure insurance. Yes. And so I think that that is a trend that we're going to start to be able to see with other carriers as well, where they may include some level of cyber protection as a part of their policies. Hmm. The brave new world. It is. It is. So I think we're we're coming up on the on the hour. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be able to address the group and um, you know um, update my my slide deck. Um, I do apologize that I wasn't able to uh, present it as we're going along, but we'll um, happy to be able to share it out to everybody. And if anybody does have any questions that they think of after this. Um, you can reach me at Linda at CMIT Stanford uh, dot com. We'll get all that information to everybody, including the deck. Great. Well, we're I we our team is so appreciative that you took the time to to do this. And um, I kind of feel, Dave, that that, you know, we should uh, somehow spank all the people that didn't join us tonight because it, it's so valuable and you are a clear, definitive expert in this area. And it's just refreshing to meet somebody that knows so much about their craft. So um, now I'm angry at people in Kazakhstan and I'm going to go call nerds to go come to my house and get all this stuff upgraded. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. This has been really, really informative. And yeah. um, I've really enjoyed the information. I feel more um, tuned in to, you know, what's going on around me. And, um, you know, I have a short list of things that I have to do that'll yeah. take me probably the next year. But <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. It was, it was very helpful. And uh, I have a long list of things to do. I think. <laughs> oh. So I just, before we, we depart, um, Trip Freeman, who's 
one of the owners of Carlson and Carlson um, mentioned in a, in a chat that um, almost all insurance carriers, homeowners, I would assume property casualty insurers have some sort of cyber protection that can be endorsed, AKA added to um, your policy. And just in general, if anybody is interested in having their homeowners or auto insurance or professional liability, anything looked at and reviewed, um, we're happy to do that through Trip, who is an expert in that field. And um, yeah, cyber professional liability umbrella policies are another part of the new world order. So if anybody wants that, um, to check that box and cover themselves, we can make that happen. So have a great evening, everybody. Linda, again, thank you so much. And um, we'll follow up. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Be safe.